hello Imogen, welcome to the podcast, thank you so much for joining me. Let's start by telling everyone, who, who are you? Well, I'm Imogen Cotter, uh, I'm a cyclist living in Belgium, but I'm from Ireland. So I have been racing for two years on the road. Uh, I started in 2019 when I was 25 um, and I moved to Belgium to focus on my road racing and see where that could get me and I'm still there two years later uh, just learning all the time and trying to figure it out. Awesome well thanks for joining us. I actually think we should start like way like at the beginning of your life. You're born in Ireland. Like, I was actually born in London. You're born in London? You're not even Irish? Yeah. Oh, outrage. So you're about as Irish as me then, Imogen. <laughs> no, so I was born in London uh, uh, in Whittington Hospital. Um, and when I was four years old, we actually moved to Ireland. So I've been in Ireland, like for, for the part of my life that I can remember, I've been living in Ireland. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was living in the west of Ireland. And I guess that I was my parents were quite like active my mom would have been into running my dad was doing like karate and you know <laughs> I mean, that's how random is it good. west of Ireland we do karate <laughs> so anyway uh when I was like eight or nine I was just uh, doing uh like cross-country running just kind of yeah. dabbling in that and then I got into swimming um and yeah, then I started like I was swimming from the age of like 10 onwards with like a swimming club. So like that kind of the crazy thing you hear now when people are like getting up at like six in the morning to go swimming before school. Like that was me. I can't imagine <laughs> doing that now. Um, so anyway, um, then my dad got into cycling and he kind of said to me, look, you're doing the running and the swimming. Like, why don't you come to like a spinning class with me and try the cycling so I did that and then I started doing triathlons um so yeah I was that was like in my late teens and I started getting like really um determined because I found that I was actually quite good at triathlons and that was kind of when I started thinking like hey like I'm not just like an average athlete like I was able to actually keep up with you know the like when I was doing triathlons I was able to keep up with the girls who were on like the national junior squad and I was like oh this is I'm getting somewhere here so then um the thing was with triathlons I always had like a lot of bad luck with them um and it really put me off them yeah. <laughs> like it really affected me uh actually enjoying them because I would like pull my timing chip off or like um like get a puncture just as I was with like the lead group and it's just like this kind of things when you're that age like I feel like if it happened to me now I'd be like okay whatever I can just get over it but I feel like at that age it was really like that affected me to the point where I was like here like this is not for me I can't do this anymore um and yeah then I decided okay I will focus on running so that was like from the age of like 17 onwards I was focusing on running um and I was quite good at running I had like a couple of um national titles on the track um you know I was good at cross country as well I had like podiums in the national cross country so I was good at running but again that was another thing where I was getting into a cycle of getting a, you know a really good training block in and then getting injured and then having to take time off and it was just like this like vicious circle of when when am I just going to get a, a solid run at things you know um and I still kept with it because I just loved running so much um and when I was like 23 I had finished university and I was living in London and I just my mom had tagged me something on Facebook it was like a talent transfer program uh, that Cycling Ireland were doing and my mom tagged me and it was like hey like this might be something you'd like and I had no idea what it was like I didn't know I didn't know what a Vendrome was I knew nothing about cycling <laughs> but they were looking for track cyclists and I was like okay you know I'm gonna give it a shot um so I just flew back from London for a weekend to Ireland just to try out this talent transfer program and I ended up being good enough to like get onto the the national squad um and it kind of all began there uh, I, you know, was with that national squad. I moved out to Mallorca to train full time with them. Um, 
but after like a year and a half I just I was just doing track cycling and yeah. it's just boring like it's really I think the the environment that I was in because it's like a talent transfer program you have to learn super quickly everything is fast tracked um and I just wasn't getting the same enjoyment out of it that that I had gotten with running um and so I left the the national team and I moved to Belgium and so that is where I am now right okay I've got a few questions so just going back to like <laughs> when you uh when you were getting into triathlon and that sort of thing what sort of age were you when you were doing that oh so triathlon I was like I guess I guess I was 15 16 and then after that, when I, I remember that I was 15 or 16, because I remember the summer that I turned, I was 16 turning 17. That was when I began to focus on running. And I decided I wanted to do like a half marathon. So like for that summer, every second day, my training for my half marathon was I would literally just run a half marathon every oh second day. God. <laughs> like it's mm. the worst training ever so yeah I, I guess I've always been from that age onwards I was always that kind of person that like if I got something in my head then I wanted to do it and yeah. I was gonna do it so, so with, yeah was running your preferred discipline of the three then when you were doing triathlon did you think like yeah definitely running is for me yeah and actually like with the the swimming I was obviously because I've been swimming since I was like 10 years old I was I, I was quite a good swimmer but actually that was another thing that put me off triathlons like the summer that I was 16 um a lot happened that summer obviously like with my half marathon <laughs> um but I was doing this thing called like surf lifesaving um and I was out swimming one day so surf life saving is like it's a really popular sport in Australia but like for some reason here in Ireland people are into it as well um and it's a lot of you know it's just basically rescuing it's like competitive lifeguarding you know you're, you're out on a paddleboard you do swims you're doing runs on the beach this kind of stuff right. um and actually one day when I was out um swimming a dolphin swam underneath me like a really huge <laughs> dolphin yeah and I had a panic attack <laughs> and I ended up like in the middle of this bay screaming I had to be like rescued by a lifeguard I was having just like oh it, it's it was the scariest thing that's ever happened to me honestly um oh so after God. that when I do triathlons every time I put my head under the water I was like closing my eyes because I was like I don't want to see anything <laughs> So, yeah, I had a lot of things that oh, kind of Lord. transpired to put me off triathlons. Oh, my goodness. You saw a dolphin in the Irish Sea. Uh, it was so scary. And I didn't even and know they got actually, that far. <laughs> <laughs> well, it ended up becoming like a really violent dolphin. And I had been saying it all throughout my teen years. I was like, hey, guys, we, we need to mind the dolphin because it's going to turn on us. And it, it ended up like turning on people so I was ahead of my time Jeez. oh my lord so well you were doing this lifeguarding competition when that happened so thankfully yeah. there was like a million lifeguards already there <laughs> well no actually I was training for the competition oh, so this training? lifeguard just happened to be on the no. beach and the whole time so he was coming out to get me on his like paddleboard and like I was out in the water for like three minutes but like the whole time I was out in the water the dolphin kept like swimming into my legs like I was out in water so deep like three meters deep or something no. and I it was like oh, I remember you. like yeah and I remember like there was a guy who had been swimming with me and I just was screaming at him help me like and he was like what can I do like I can't help you and it was just like that feeling of total helplessness like I was out in a bay I couldn't see like there was nowhere I could go. Like I was just literally in the middle of the water. It was so oh scary, honestly. My was, God. That was the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. So, oh. yeah. Yeah, I can see why. I mean, you're not scared of Is crosswinds it... in Belgium now, are you, after that? <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Like the, the road, road racing is so safe in comparison. Yeah. Oh my God, you don't get some dolphin just coming out and like whoop we'll off into the peloton. <laughs> <laughs> it was honestly god that, that's a, a side story but yeah it was literally <laughs> the worst thing ever so like people now are like oh I'd love to go swim with dolphins I'm like no you really no. wouldn't <laughs> Don't do no. it. 
stay away from those crazy bastards. <laughs> yeah. Oh, crazy. So, okay, right. So you, you, you have the scariest moment of your life. A dolphin tries to come for you. And then you think, right, okay, I'm going to do running now. <laughs> yeah. Running is so much safer. Running yeah. is probably the safest of all three. So, yeah, I decided yeah. to focus on running. Like when I've been doing triathlons, um, a, a local running coach had kind of noticed my times I was doing. And he was like, will you come and run for our team? So mm -hmm. that's what I ended up doing, like, when I was 17, 18 onwards. Um, so and you I said loved you it. won, like, national national track running titles and stuff. Like, what what you, what were your events? What sort of times did you do? Oh, uh, like, I don't think my times were anything exceptional. So I look back on them and I'm like, that's not a great time. It was just that I was doing, like, the longer distances. Like, I was doing 3K and 5K, and I guess they're not the popular distances. Um, like, you know, that they, they're not the things that people really want to do because they're like they're just a slog it's like whatever 10 15 minutes of like just slogging it out on the track and people don't like yeah. that um but I was always that kind of endurance uh endurance athlete anyway so like even when I went across to cycling you know I originally started doing the track cycling um and that that was such a like explosive high power event that I really wasn't suited to. So it was only when I like transferred over into road cycling um, that I could actually use that endurance side that I had. Yeah. No, definitely. It's super interesting. I think like there's a lot of cyclists who do a bit of running or runners who do a bit of cycling, yeah. um, but to be at that level in both running and then transfer that over to cycling is, is, is really cool and really impressive. So Talk to me more about the Talent ID programme and like what you said you were living in London then, what were you doing in London? Yeah, so after I finished university, I moved to London. <clears throat> Sorry, <laughs> that's my COVID cough still lingering. Yeah. <laughs> um, so after I moved, uh, after I finished university, I moved to London and like I said, I was born in London, so I still have family there and um, we actually still have a house there and my sister is living in that house. So it did really feel like a second home um I really mm. I love London I definitely wouldn't live there again because it's so bad for cycling but like I really yeah. loved it um, just the like it's busy it's fun when you're young and not a cyclist <laughs> so anyway I was living in London and I was working like um I was working full-time as a, a receptionist at like a GP surgery like I wasn't you know I hadn't started like laying out my career path I still had no idea what I was doing um and yeah my mom tagged me in something on Facebook it was just like cycling Ireland were looking for cyclists and I was like okay like I'll give it a shot I, I really wanted to come home for a weekend anyway so it kind of tied in nicely that I could get that done at the same time um and I remember like coming home and doing the test and my numbers weren't anything to write home about they weren't incredible or anything um but yeah, it, it, I almost didn't know what they were looking for. Like they were looking for track cyclists. But I remember saying to my mom and dad afterwards, like, oh, like maybe they'll put me on the road team. You know, maybe they'll do mm. X, Y, Z. Like I had no idea I was actually trying out for the track. Um, but they ended up, my numbers ended up being good enough to get through to like the next round, which was that I followed a training plan for six weeks. Um, and so I, I'd gone from like training barely training for cycling at all to then I was training every day for cycling so in that six weeks um my numbers again at the end they were impressive but they weren't like you know anything to write home about they were just it, it was the fact that I got into the next round which is getting onto like the national team um that was more put in place by the fact that I had made such a big improvement from my first round to my second Sorry. round testing and um, like the numbers that I put out were like I think like 40 percent better in some of the tests Whoa. so you know they were like okay she's she's obviously got proof yeah, yeah. um <clears throat> so then um then I got onto the national team and at the time there were eight of us on the team and it was going to be kind of like an attrition thing that basically they'd start getting rid of the the weaker riders as time went on um until eventually you were left with four riders so like you can imagine that's that's the worst feeling ever you're on a team with eight people but like you're always looking around like who's yeah, weaker yeah. than me like 
it was so awful honestly it was like so stressful and like always constantly wondering like who's putting out more power than me like uh, who's going to be like a millisecond faster than me on the track today it was that kind of environment um and so anyway I, I ended up eventually being in the final four but um I guess I always felt that because I was an endurance athlete I was never punchy like I just didn't feel like I had that extra punch for the track. Um, mm. I feel like now maybe if I went back and, and tried the track again, maybe I'd have it. But because I was such a new cyclist and like I hadn't done all of this like track riding and explosive stuff before, I just didn't have the extra kick that I thought I needed. Yeah, especially um, coming again, from running, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, especially coming from running. So I had been doing like 5K, like 10K, that kind of running. I hadn't been ever doing explosive running. Um, so yeah, I got onto, or I was in the final four and it was, it was going well, but I just felt that I was never, I, I, I felt like I was never good enough. Um, mm. and I was almost waiting for the chop, um, which was just a horrible, horrible situation to be in. It's a horrible situation yeah. to go to the track every day. Like when you're going to the velodrome, literally, if you're, like 0.1 of a second slower that that like ruins your day if you're like 0.1 of a second slower than your team and that's so bizarre when I think back on it I'm like wow that was like a really tough time because like I said I had moved from London out to Mallorca to train for time so I had like that we weren't funded by Cycling Ireland like so we had basically no money um, mm. I was relying on my mom and dad to pay my rent, like buy my food. And it was kind of like I just put my life on hold to just cycle. But what was I getting back? Like, it was just mm. such a, mm. like, oh, it was a horrible time. And I left there. So I left there um, at the, in like September of 2018. Um, and like all of 2018, we had been focusing on the Europeans. Like we were doing the Europeans. That was in the August of 2018. And that was like my goal that was all I wanted like you know I could get past all the hardship because I was going to get to the Europeans and I was I was so focused on it um and like a month before the Europeans that the head coach brought in um another rider out of nowhere and she took my place on the squad and I remember being like oh my god I've literally put my life on hold and nothing was guaranteed like nothing was yeah. set in stone. and that was such an awful feeling like to realize that yeah I wasn't actually owed anything like um and I I felt at that stage that I had to leave I just felt like I cannot do this anymore because it's so it's just such you don't enjoy cycling and I really didn't enjoy cycling I remember I left um in the September of that year and I went to Belgium to race and I remember being like, oh, my God, this is why people enjoy cycling, like a coffee stop. <laughs> like when we were on the national team, it was like, oh, don't stop for a coffee in the middle of your ride. Like, you know, you just get on with your training and that's that. And I was like, oh, my God, we can go for a coffee stop. We can like cycle outside in the sun. We can just have mm -hmm. loads of fun on our bikes. It was just like the best feeling ever to go from such a controlled environment, to like freedom. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was it was like an awakening. <laughs> Yeah, crikey. I mean, that sounds tough. And am I right to thinking, were you trying to do the team pursuit at Euros? Yeah, it was a team yeah. pursuit. So it's like, uh, I think that was as well, like that that person who came in like a month before me. When you're riding in like a team of four, you, you get so used to like knowing what someone's going to do on the bike. Mm -hmm. um, and bringing someone in a month beforehand, like, it's unfair on the person they bring in a month beforehand because they went to the Euros, but like it was a shit show. So, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's a tough <laughs> one, especially like when you've been putting in, like you say, month to month to get to that. Like yeah. to be so close is yeah. really tough. And you know, I can I can understand the the move over to road. Like I'm sure you experienced it, but like being inside a velodrome all day, every day you don't see the sun <laughs> like you're just inside all day um which is so yeah. opposite to like how most people get involved in cycling 
you know, yes, yeah. riding outside the social aspect, like you say. Yeah, definitely. I'm like, I'd be interested, like when you were in Belgium, what what did you think of it though? I mean, I'm flipping the <laughs> question on you <laughs> now, but flip the, flip the interview. I mean, for me, I went to Belgium 2017 for 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 a mm -hmm. year. I'd already, I suppose, experienced racing in Belgium previous years when I'd been riding for WNT and you know when I was younger doing commesses and that sort of thing but for me going to Belgium it's just the the whole thing is just set up for racing um I mean my experience was I think slightly different due to the fact that you know for me that was kind of winding down like my racing as it were so for me I was st I was pretty lonely to be honest in Belgium um, <laughs> I don't want to like be a be a downer on this uh, on this interview. Oh, but, yeah, I, yeah. Like, I I struggled with it a lot. So I think you know it, it is amazing when your results are going well and you're improving. But if you are if your results aren't there, the same as with the track program, right? Like if your results aren't there and you get your head kicked in every week, it's pretty hard to keep coming back mm. every week and being like, "Yep, come on then, kick my head in again." <laughs> <laughs> let's just do it <laughs> yeah. get it over with <laughs> yeah so so for me it was maybe uh, you know a different experience for you you're you're thriving out there in Belgium you've got a boyfriend you've got a dog um mm. so you know I'd like to think that you're you're having a better time out there than me. <laughs> yeah yeah no definitely but I do feel the same I can totally relate to your feelings that like it is a really lonely place like mm. it's grand when everyone's there in the summer and you're like let's meet up for a ride let's get a coffee mm. like let's go to race together and that's like such a nice feeling but like when you're there and it's a bit quieter like that is miserable and like mm. people you know people think like oh she's out there chasing her dream like you know you're full-time cycling you can't complain about anything like I've had messages like that on Instagram and I've had comments like that but like I know that I'm cycling full-time and yeah it's great and yeah I know I'll look back on this in 20 years and be like wow I was so lucky but like it is bloody hard yeah and I think that we do ourselves a disservice by pretending that it's not bloody hard you know yeah um I think it gets so, glamorized though, doesn't it? Like, you know, oh, the Flandrian, yeah. this epic figure of, you know, someone who's just like <laughs> hardcore, you know, they're just tanned brown legs and they just like yeah. they never grimace and they just like eat cobbles. Just for get stuck into know? the cobbles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like you yeah. said, you know, it is a tough lifestyle and, you know, any elite sport is going to have an element of like loneliness and you know I think the things that you miss out on is like your family right it's you know you don't see your family when you're away yeah. and like over the course of the year you don't think it really makes a difference but it does and I think a lot of people with COVID are kind of feeling the same thing right yeah that's so true I feel like yeah people think yeah you're doing all this full-time cycling but yeah you're missing like the birthday or you're missing the wedding anniversary or you're missing you know whatever it is like a family barbecue I like there's countless things I've missed over the year and I don't ever like to think of it as like oh I've missed out on everything because I know that obviously with like elite sport comes sacrifice but it still doesn't make it any easier and you still yeah. like you know even with friendships that you have like if you're away racing all the time and if you're you know not able to go out on a Friday night because you've got a four-hour cycle in the morning it's all those things that like you just end up missing out on and like you say it's like not one thing it just happens over time it's yeah it's like an accumulation then, right yeah you know I yeah, think definitely. like when I was racing I always used to love my birthday because it was the end of September and most people had stopped racing by then so it was always the first like party of the year because Off all season. my friends who were cyclists it was like right you've got one month get all your fun <laughs> into that one month <laughs> yeah yeah it's not that that's fun, so true like, like it's fun, but it's a job right when you're doing it full time yeah yeah definitely um it's definitely like you know I feel now when I'm home in Ireland it's easier to like not see the hard side of things because I come home mm -hmm. in Ireland and family and you know you don't have the added thing of like taking care of a house and whatever on top of it because you're home with your whole family but um yeah when I'm in Belgium it's like 
you still have to do everything else on top of doing like a five hour ride or like a three hour ride mm -hmm. with really hard intervals. And, you know, I obviously like I'm cycling, well, I'm cycling full time, but I'm also like coaching as well. So there's that on top of it. And then I'm doing like some social media work and that's something else. Like, you know, it's, it's not like I'm just sitting around all day after I finish training, like, yeah, oh, yeah. Nah. all right, <laughs> cup of tea. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's life as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So when, what year did you actually move to Belgium then? Was it the end of the 2018? Yeah, I actually, so, yeah, yeah I went out there in 2018 um, and I met my boyfriend when I was out there. Um, and I ended up like, I, my plan was then, I kind of, as soon as I got there, I was like, I love it. Like, I love the culture. <laughs> That has obviously changed over time. I'm not as big a fan of Belgium anymore. But at the time I was like, I guess, cause I, like I said, I go from such a controlled environment to a bit of freedom. It was just like, mm. oh, I love this place. I think I associated like the feeling with the place. Um, mm. And so I was like, this is amazing. I need to go here. And that was the end of 2018. And I had said to myself, okay, I'm gonna move there in 2019. I'm gonna work for the winter and just um, move there in 2019 and do like the racing season in 2019. And my boyfriend, he was just like, why are you waiting till 2019? Like just move here now. So I just did, I just was like, <laughs> here I go. And I did it. So I didn't really think about it. I just kind of moved there. I knew no Dutch, I knew, I just I, I knew very little I was just kind of throwing myself in at the deep end um and I, I moved there in November of 2018 and I like got a really crappy job like working in mm. a bakery where nobody spoke any English I would just spend the whole day like putting a cake on a conveyor belt yeah. like again one more like thousands of cakes like, it was just like the worst job ever but it, it was just like where I needed to be I guess I just saved up enough money and um, and I was able to to work at, and train and then I got into the racing and that that was my beginning of racing in Belgium. Nice so do you do you pro the Netherlands? Yeah I do I can, I can speak it I can I'm very like uh hesitant to speak it though I'm like, yeah, like my mm -hmm. my accent is awful <laughs> I always like I think it's more like that I'm always worried I'll make a mistake and that mm. everybody there speaks so much English like English is such like a core part of their yeah like it's it's everywhere like the music they listen to but also like sometimes when you're watching a tv show there they will just have like sentences in English you know it, it's they all understand a bit of English um mm. so yeah I, I do speak Netherlands but mm -hmm. I, I'm more like I just watch TV and I I can understand it, but I'm I've never like had a conversation. Did I also see. Did I also see that you're fluent in Irish? Yes, yeah, I'm fluent in Irish. So I went to um, I went to my secondary school. Um, it was all in Irish, so like maths, what? um, French. I did that through Irish. Uh, oh my and my dad. <laughs> My dad also speaks fluent Irish, like since we were babies, my dad would speak Irish to us. So, Did you speak um, Irish at home then? Uh, my sisters, it's really weird, like both of my sisters speak Irish back to my dad, but I would always just like speak back in English. I never got into the speaking in Irish at home thing, but I understand everything yeah. like and I, I can speak it. I just like listen to it. Like sometimes when I'm in Belgium, I'll put on like the Irish radio station to remind myself, oh, oh, oh nice. this is... Irish <laughs> yeah <laughs> get back to your roots <laughs> exactly yeah so oh, that's awesome so you're in Belgium now and let's talk a bit about the racing because obviously you had a, a great time 2019 you got some up there in some commesters and everything and then 2020 what a penis of a year <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> the year that never happened did you get any racing in in 2020 yeah so actually I, I came back here on St Patrick's Day I got like one race in at the start of the season and then everything started getting cancelled so I came back to Ireland on like in like the middle of March um and I was stuck here then for three months I went back to Belgium at the beginning of July and so that whole time that I was in Ireland there was a really strict lockdown like uh at first we weren't able to go more than two kilometers outside of our house oh and God. then it was five kilometers. 
so I had to do everything on the turbo like I was on the turbo every day two times a day like three hours I was just like getting it done um and yeah it was it, it was a really like weird time as an athlete because I feel like everyone's like oh like do I need to be race fit when is there going to be a race like it was kind of just mm. constantly verging being race fit um so I was yeah I was I was just on swift all the bloody time it was so it was so hard um but when I got back to Belgium I was worrying like oh will, will this have like messed me up will I you know be way behind everyone but I actually came back and I was like I was just so fit um and like in in July at the end of July <coughs> I won a race um mm. which was like amazing I was like oh my god this is it I've, I've reached it like <laughs> I was just so happy um because I had been like a goal of mine for so long um and then like there were loads of races cancelled again and then when we got back racing in um in August I did really well like there was a crit there and I was like up the front with like uh, Yolene Dora I was like in a breakaway for basically the whole race I was like this is crazy like I'm really fit um and I was just feeling so good um and then I so I got called up because of those results and because I'd been riding strong I got called up to um team Cyclotel so I was riding mm -hmm. with a club team but Cyclotel was a UCI team and they needed like um a stagiaire for two world tour races um and so I got called up really late to them. Um, I was called up to do those races, like literally two weeks before they were on, um, yeah. which was like just such a bizarre thing because they're on at the end or middle of October. And basically for me, my season had been over since like the end of September. Like I hadn't, mm. I had been cycling, but like pinging, like I wasn't what you need to be to do those races. Um, and yeah, I got called up to do them. And that was such a step up. Like that was, so, I wasn't fit. Like the girls who were who were there had obviously, you know, the World Tour riders had known that they were going to be racing in October. Whereas for me, mm. I hadn't thought I would be racing then. So I just like, wasn't fit enough. Yeah. Um, I just wasn't, it was, it was really hard because I'd been like struggling so hard to stay motivated all year when everything was getting canceled that by the time October rolled around, I kind of just given up. I was just like, oh, I'm so done with this year. <laughs> like, I'm yeah. just so ready to have I think it's so mentally taxing as well, not knowing when you're next going to race, like how fit do I need to get? Like, what training should I even do? Because I've got no goals anymore. Like, yeah, purpose. Like, oh, that's tough. That was so hard. Yeah, that was like the hardest part of it all, like was actually just the mental aspect of it. So yeah, I got called up to do these races, which was like, great. It's just, you know, a thing I'll never forget, you know, that I was able to ride the second Ronde van Vlaanderen when I was mm. you know, in my second year of racing. But it was just, um, I just wasn't good enough. I just wasn't fit enough. I wasn't, you know, at, it wasn't the right time for me. Um, so yeah. I did two races with Cyclotel and then they ended up, yeah, the, the team shut down. Um, so yeah, I'm back with Kirkins Rodent now for 2021. Nice, nice. Yeah, so in 2019, you actually ended up second in the Irish National Road Champs. Did you, did the Irish National Road Champs go ahead in 2020 or not? Yeah, they did, but did I just you? didn't fly back. Yeah. Oh, I would. I was I, just I'm so excited. I wanna, I wanna see you take that chicken dinner. <laughs> oh, so do I. So do I. <laughs> please god but um yeah I, they went ahead but it was just I just couldn't be I couldn't be arsed because I would have to have gone back two weeks beforehand gone into quarantine you know yeah. and, and then I wouldn't have been fit on my bike and and then they could have been cancelled last minute as well like it was such a strange mm. year that I was like I'm not spending like 300 euro on flights to just not race so yeah, exactly you know it's the kind of thing as well, like, you know, when you put any amount, like if you're putting so much of your own money into a race and you like get a puncture after 2K, I would be screaming, I'd be furious. So yeah. I just didn't want to risk it. That's the bad thing about cycling, like, especially if you're self-funding for a lot of stuff, you know, it's like if you have a bad race, if you puncture, like you literally could have driven four or five hours 
you could have spent all your money on hotels everything like that and like if you're doing it on your own and you puncture or you have an incident like there's no team car for you you're just like you're just oh, on the side of the road like, great life choice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy I spent all of that money <laughs> yes love bikes right now oh <laughs> uh, yeah tough times well, it's just been such a weird year hasn't it I mean I, I mean I'm happy that like the grand tours went ahead but equally like I just wonder like what is this 2021 gonna look like yeah um you know I guess everyone's kind of hoping and praying that all the races will kind of happen as normal but for example like in the UK it's worse now than it was in March yeah. when originally it locked down so in terms of like British teams coming out to Europe I think it would be very difficult or at least there's going to yeah. be have to be some sort of protocol and if you're an amateur rider I don't know if you're going to be able to race no that's what I think like because I am an amateur like I think people say oh well, you're a pro but like I'm not getting paid by my team so like I'm at a club team level and yeah. a lot of the messages now like in our in the team like chat on whatsapp like so many of them are getting cancelled already um which is just you know you just you just didn't think it would be the same again for 2021 it's so difficult to to stay motivated and like to yeah just <clears throat> to just stay on top of your game when it's just everything is getting cancelled oh. oh I hear that so what what kind of things are you doing to stay motivated because you said you know you've been keeping on your training and stuff and you've been hitting Zwift and like uh, you know if if anyone follows Imogen on Instagram, we can see you on your bike every day, just, you know, doing your thing. How do you stay motivated? Yeah, I mean, so uh, over Christmas, I actually had COVID, um, which meant I was off my bike for like at least a week. Um, and I think what's motivating me now is getting back to the fitness that I was at before I had that. So like every time I do a session and I upload it to Training Peaks, I'm like, oh, what's my fitness? Like, am I back yet like am I good yet um so I think there's kind of that element you know I, I've never I, I always have like a long-term goal but like ha actually like breaking something down and having like a short-term goal to work towards every day is something that I love and like I see every training session every day is like you know that's a goal like so I just do my training session and that that's what motivates me like that's like a goal a short-term goal um on my list so that kind of stuff motivates me just having like a training session to aim towards to get like to nail that um and and then I'm lucky like I've just been able to stay motivated like that and um, I've always been quite motivated though when I get a goal in my head yeah so just just out of so. interest what is your what is your long-term goal with with the cycling yeah so I I guess my long-term goal with cycling <laughs> I was going to say was, I, I should put it in the present tense, but it, it was to go pro. Um, but obviously with like, I, I'm I'm old in terms of cyclist years. I'm 27 now. I turned 28 this, this summer. And I guess that like with racing being cancelled last year and then a lot of racing being cancelled this year, like they're precious years, I guess, for me because, yeah, my time is 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 limited in what I can do in this sport so like I hope that one day I could get a chance to go up to a UCI team like that would actually be my goal and like I was I was getting there with sick tell but obviously it closed down so my goal has been to go to a UCI team um and I hope that that does happen for me but I still have a lot of goals outside of like the team goal like I would love to become Irish champ one day but I guess it's just hard. I found it really difficult last year as well to set myself a goal when everything started getting cancelled. What am I, like, what can I aim towards? Like, what's actually going to go ahead, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's why I think it's such a weird time to be, like, an athlete because you're kind of trying to figure out what's yeah, a realistic I mean, if, goal. If you're a racer, you're a racer, right? So you're motivated yeah. by, by events. And I mean, I'm not yeah. racing nowadays like I used to but I still you know I, I still ride a bit and my motivation to ride or run or whatever is based around events oh I'm going to do this sportive or I'm going to do this half marathon I need to get fit for them so then that motivates me but now I, now that there's less events like 
even just me personally as like you know a recreational cyclist now it's kind of like what am I preparing for so I guess it's got to be you know like more fitness related goals yeah. or you know related more on something you can control yeah definitely uh I think that that's something I I, I need to kind of sit down and do I kind of need to for me, for like mentally for me, I really, I actually worked with a sports psychologist last year because when I was like having really tough time motivating myself, I was like, this isn't normal. Like it was like September, October before I did those big races. And I was like, I need to get my head back in the game, but I was struggling so much. Um, and I worked with a sports psychologist, which was so helpful. And um, so I think I need to actually just go back and kind of, you know, do that again and, you know so what sort just, of thing did you do with when you were when you were speaking to a sports psychologist um so she was really helpful in that I had actually worked with her when I was with Cycling Ireland at Mallorca so she kind of knew my journey I guess you know uh, she she knew what I had come from and like the environment that I come from within Cycling Ireland so she was really helpful um and I guess she just helped me to reframe things a bit because instead mm. of me being like so unmotivated I don't want to like get out on my bike I kind of just had to make that switch with my mindset which I think is really easy for people to say like oh you just need to change your mindset but actually sometimes you need to talk to a professional to like help you figure out why mm. you need to change yeah and actually talk you through doing it um so god she was just brilliant like it really it really just helped me to get my act together for like the two weeks before I was racing. Like I just had to, you know, instead of viewing it as a, oh, maybe I'll finish, will I get around? Like, oh, I'm not good enough to do those races. I had to view it as like, what an opportunity. Like I've only been cycling for like two years and look at what I'm getting to do. Yeah. I, I'm so lucky, like, you know, and, and that's true. It's true, like, but, and I knew it, but I had to hear someone say it to me um so yeah like you get to do it rather than you have to do it yes yeah exactly exactly so it was so helpful yeah no that's so important and I think like the mental health side of cycling especially like during this crazy time has been it's been tough for a lot of athletes you know I, I've had a few interviews with other pros ex-pros people in the industry and you know it's a tough time for everyone whether you're trying to ride a bike really fast or whether you're trying to sell bike kit or whatever you're doing so I think that 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 is something that we've all we've all come to realize is that actually like mental health it's important to talk about it and just like everyone does struggle with it and that's fine you know (laughs) definitely and I feel (laughs) yeah it's more realistic to actually talk about the fact that like hey I don't really want to ride my bike I'm not really feeling this like you know we're all human like people might look at an elite athlete and think oh they must just get up every morning and like want to ride their bike all the time but like no I mean if you read a lot of like autobiographies of athletes they will be completely honest about it there's times when you're just like oh you know what not today like literally not just today. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess as well like you know Imogen you have quite a large following on on Instagram and I guess you know maybe people have this perception because they're not doing what you do and you know Instagram is like the highlights reel of cycling it's it's making it look good you know I think people don't always realize that actually there's a lot more to it than just the pretty pictures and like winning races and yeah I feel that that wouldn't go down as well. Like, you know, you you want to show people the hard work that goes into it, but no one wants to see like, you know, people don't want to like those pictures of when you're actually just like slogging it out in the rain. Like people are just like, no, just show me a nice pretty picture in some lycra. (laughs) It's like, hey, no, it's actually, it it doesn't look like this 99% of the time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly right. So you actually on the side you, you kind of mentioned it earlier you do you do some coaching with panache coaching um yeah how did you get into that how long have you been doing that so yeah I was um in university sports and exercise science and like I did my placements um in like a gym kind of 
well a gym is not like the right word for it like they worked with like teams um you know working on their testing and mm. I was always really interested in that um so I I had done like my coaching qualifications um just for like being an exercise professional or like a fitness instructor but I really loved the coaching side of it so like I had a um a running club in my hometown uh during university and I was coaching people like couch to 10k couch to 5k um and I also had some athletes that I was kind of coaching on the side as well just you know uh who might have been at a more elite level so I've always been really into that side of the coaching um and kind of helping people across all levels like I said I was working with like absolute beginners to elite so I liked having that variation um but I hadn't I hadn't taken a step in cycling um even though I was really interested in it and like reading into it I hadn't kind of taken a step into you know actually saying right I'm going to do coaching um and it was only when my current coach um Ronan McLaughlin he's with Panache Coaching he kind of said to me like would you be interested in doing some coaching like it would help with funding your your cycling um yeah and I'm like do you want to do it so I was thinking I, I was quite back and forth about it because I remember being a bit it, it's almost like imposter syndrome like I think a lot of mm. people can relate to everything like you really sometimes think what am I doing like am I good enough um but anyway I just decided to do it and that was uh back in February of last year and yeah I've been doing it since then and I I really enjoy it and it's something that I really want to work on improving over the next few years like I would love to do more courses in it um I would love to eventually open up my own coaching company so it's it's definitely something that is like a passion of mine yeah definitely I like it a lot no, that's awesome. And I think also having, you know, riders to coach must be nice in the fact that, you know, I'm sure that, you know, they're maybe struggling to work out what their goals are. And like, it's nice that they have someone to talk to about that. And also that, you know, you're all on the same page with it. Yeah. And I think it's good as well, because it kind of keeps you grounded, like in what, you know, I think when you being like a, an athlete of a certain level like you're kind of always just thinking about your own numbers and you know you just kind of lose out on the enjoyment that someone actually gets from doing like a, a sportive or like a, mm. you know think of the things that people love when they first begin cycling it's like the basic things like I want to be able to ride 100k and mm. you forget as you as you like progress how enjoyable those things are but it's nice to have that reminder Oh yeah, for sure. Like uh, that must be super, super nice. So yeah. 2021, any, any more plans? In, who knows? <laughs> uh, it's really hard. I, I guess I, I'm still in Ireland now. Um, so I hopefully will be going back to Belgium in the next couple of weeks. Um, if racing kicks off, of which I, I really do doubt, but if racing kicks off, hopefully uh, sometime in March, fingers crossed <laughs> candles lit everything please yeah. <laughs> but uh hopefully I'll be back for racing and um I I'm actually this year getting getting a gravel bike because I just wanted to make my training a bit more fun I think mm. like it's been like a really hard year and like a few months as well just with covid and everything and i just feel that like i want to get back to the really fun part of it i don't want to always be like looking at my heart rate or my power i just want to go yeah. out on my bike i'm hoping yeah in the next month or two get my gravel bike and just like start enjoying getting mucky and yeah yeah getting out. exactly like you say just reconnecting with the fun is so important yeah. whatever level you are at in cycling yeah. you know um going out hitting the trails just mixing it up keeps it keeps it interesting keeps it keeps it fun so you said mm -hmm. you had covid the dreaded oh, yes. rona virus what was that like <laughs> yeah i was um, i was home in ireland i'm home in ireland over christmas i came back in like the middle of december and i had two covid tests um when I came back, uh, both were negative. I had one on the first day I arrived back and one after five days and both were negative. So, you know, I was feeling totally fine. Um, and it was on 
New Year's Day that I was called for another COVID test because one of my sisters tested positive. And I was thinking, mm -hmm. oh my God, like this is, I, I felt so well that I was like, I definitely don't have it, but I'll go for this test anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And I went for the test and the next day it came back positive. Um, and I remember just, I was just like, really? Like, really? But I oh. felt so good. Like, honestly, Kira, you, it's such a strange disease because like I was feeling so fine. Um, and then the next day, so on the second, I I was like, here, I have it, but I'm feeling so good. I'm just going to go on the turbo. Like, because I just felt so fine. So I was obviously in quarantine in my room, but the turbo is just up the hall. So I was like, those will be my two rooms. And I went up got on the turbo and as soon as I got on I was like oh my god I'm actually gonna vomit like I could not figure it out it was like I was putting out like 90 watts but I was like this is awful I got off the turbo after like half an hour and I I was like I need to go to bed I somehow had a shower and then I got into bed and slept for like 12 hours it had just destroyed I was just not able to like over my eyes I was so weak um and that kind of that feeling lasted for about two days um and then after that I was totally fine that was it oh my goodness I can't even imagine like the anxiety and stress of like you've got this positive yeah. test you feel fine and you're like um <laughs> what do I do yeah, now yeah it's so weird you expect to feel like I, I suppose you expect to feel so bad but like I felt so good um but after that, I was like, right, I, I'll take a week off like the bike. Um, and actually straight away after I had that one, like those couple of days where I was just feeling so weak, everything just stopped. It was like, OK, now I'm better again, um, which was such a strange feeling. So I was still like in quarantine and everything. Um, but I I only had to take like a week off the bike. It's recommended you take a week off the bike and then build up really slowly again, because um, like long term with COVID you can develop problems with the heart if you kind of go back to exercise and intense exercise too soon so I, I just kind of was really gradually kind of getting back into the bike and and now I'm back to nearly where I was so it, it's mm. I feel so lucky because I, I do actually talk with you know since I put it off my Instagram like a lot of people would message me and be like you know I've I've been diagnosed or I was diagnosed last like May and I still can't cycle, you know, 50K. You know, I feel so lucky that I've just been able to Bounce get back, back to normal. Yeah, because it's just not- Your sisters had it and your family, like how are they doing? Are they all right? Yeah, like it was a weird thing again, you know, myself and my two sisters, we were fine. You know, we were a bit weak and whatever. We felt a bit lazy, but like nothing, nothing too bad but then my mom got it and my mom was really sick with it and that was kind of the worrying thing you know you it's such a strange disease and how it affects everyone so differently um mm -hmm. my mom was like oh she was so sick with it and she's just getting back to like getting back to strength now so it's kind of um yeah it's just very strange to see how it affects everyone so differently it like when you actually have the symptoms and afterwards you know how it affects different athletes as well so strange yeah and I think like a lot of people you know that unless it's someone that they know really closely like I, I mean I, I said to to Jay the other day you know like it doesn't really feel real unless you know someone yeah. who's got it unless you know yeah. like what's happening to them and I think like more and more you know you see on Instagram I think I saw like in one day like three different people all saying oh I've got it and you're like yeah. oh because especially when it's you're so at home, like you don't see. I like yeah, it's so strange. Like, but they're saying about like the new strain, you can get it from like touching the same loaf of bread as someone. So like, it's so contagious that you can't think. You know, I think there was a bit of a stigma around like, oh, you know, saying that you had it. You know, people wouldn't have put it on social media or anything. But I thought when I got it, like there is such a stigma around it but I did abide by the rules like I didn't you know I wasn't going around like coughing and not washing my hands or anything like I was so safe and I still got it so like they're like if someone gets it it doesn't mean they're clumsy or lazy or like dirty it just means that it, they've been really unlucky you know yeah I mean that's the thing of it isn't it it's just really really contagious so you've got to do your, your do your best but there's no way of mm -hmm. telling you could drive yourself mad trying to work out where you got it from but it's good that you're on your way to recovery 
and you know I'm glad you're feeling better and I just want to say thank you for joining me on the podcast it was a pleasure thank you for having me <laughs> um if people want to find you Imogen where do they go uh I'm on Instagram Imogen Cotter and yeah I put out like two YouTube videos last year so I might do a few more this year if I get oh, around to it um I've not seen them Imogen oh Christ <laughs> try to edit them um I'm not very technological but I mean if Covid carries on this year I will literally have to if I'm in Belgium all lonely and like doing nothing you might see a bit more of me there <laughs> Yeah, awesome i'll leave all the links to find imogen down below all right well thanks for listening everyone <laughs> if you enjoyed this video be sure to like and subscribe and to listen to the full podcast you can search the kira mcvitty podcast in your favorite podcast platform or you can click the link below keep risking it for a biscuit and i'll see you in the next video